Data Skeptic is the official podcast of dataskeptic.com, bringing you stories, interviews, and mini episodes on topics in data science, machine learning, statistics, and artificial intelligence. Today, Linda, we're going to talk about LSTMs, or long short term memory. Now, that might have some intuitive appeal. What do you suppose that means? So, anyways, you said long term short memory? Close. Long short-term memory. So what's that? It's a special case of recurrent neural networks that we talked about last time. Do you remember a bit about how those work? Recurrent neural networks. Sequential neural networks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They work great for a lot of things, but there's a problem with recurrent neural networks. And basically, it's the same problem as the vanishing gradient that we've talked about before. They're great at learning on like the most recent training examples and doing stuff like that. But when you want to extend them and maybe have something that has a, a long context to it, it becomes more difficult. So let's start for a practical example. Did you ever work in fast food? No, but you did. I sure did. Yeah, I got my start at the McDonald's Corporation. But you were a barista, right? Is that is that correct? Starbucks barista. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the process of managing one drink. Actually, I didn't really, they didn't let me touch the bar. Oh, no. So what was your role? Cashier or oh. frappuccino maker. Well, let me tell you why I thought of my fast food experience. When we would prepare the burgers, there was a certain order to it. First, you put the patty, then, well, I don't know if I remember it, but the one detail I do remember is you had to put on the ketchup before you put on the mustard. That was very important. Otherwise, it was wrong. Mustard came second. Why? That was the rules. They never explained it exactly. I always thought that was a little weird, but that was the rule. The point is, when you're making the burger, you can always kind of look at it and know what the next state is. So even if I like completely lose my mind or I can't remember anything, I can look down and be like, oh, well, there's ketchup there, but there's no mustard. Ah, the next step is the mustard, and I do it. So it's easy to learn, like, one-step sequences. That's not too hard. Well, with one step, where's the sequence? A goes to B. That's a sequence. Okay. And even, you know, like shorter things like a song, you know, it might be four chords. They repeat. That's not that long of a sequence. And also it's repetitive. It goes in, in particular order. But there are some things where the sequence might be much, much longer. The basic idea here is that there's sometimes you need to take an older idea and keep it relevant in order to fight the vanishing gradient and, and also to, to make it capable of learning these more complicated things. So a, an LSTM is an attempt to do that. It introduces this idea of a neural unit. So instead of talking about one neuron, we're going to talk about a collection of components. It's almost like its own circuit kind of, so to speak. So they're pretty complicated, and I'm going to put a picture in the show notes, so I encourage people to go look at that just to get a sense of what an LSTM looks like. But I want to break it down into three important pieces and talk about those. But before that, let's talk about something called the cell state. So every LSTM unit is every neural unit can be thought of as having a state, and that's sort of like its memory. So a great example of that is in uh, like natural language processing. When you encounter a negation word like not, or I would never. So if I said, I would never, the fact that I said, I would never, as soon as you encounter that phrase, you have to kind of remember that and apply it to the rest of the sentence, right? Mm -hmm. I think the way language is set up, we know to at least pay attention to the end of the sentence, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. Well, that is pretty easy for our brains to do, but uh, not obviously easy for neural networks to do. So that's one of the reasons things like that, that LSTMs were introduced. So how would an LSTM benefit us in that situation? Well, ideally your training would bring the network to the point where there's one or maybe a collection of these neural units, these LSTMs, that as soon as they encounter a negation phrase like, I would never they kind of store that in their cell state. So there's like this this carrier line going through, and it, it maybe they put they put a bit very high on that value, saying like, aha, there's this information here that there's a negation taking place. And then as every new word comes through, they look at what's being added to the sentence, and then they decide, oh, do I want to just pass this word through, or do I also want to remind everyone around me that there's a negation in play? But I don't understand the difference between the negation versus the positive. If you're like, I would always do this, you still have to remember it, same thing. That's a good point. So then there would be maybe another LSTM or maybe a slightly different version of the same one that would store that bit of information in a particular way. It would remember like, oh, now we're in the affirmative or something like that. But even if you just take out the affirmative and say, I would 
you still have to remember to un- understand the sentence. What's the difference? True. When I'm describing like what it remembers, actually that is not programmed. There's nothing like where you say check for negation and store and set the negation flag equal to one. It doesn't work that way at all. It is through the process of training the network that the network finds its own representation. It actually kind of comes up with its own, almost a language of encoding this data. So an LSTM's job is to figure out certain things it wants to remember, to store them, and then to recognize the conditions under which they become relevant again, and then like release the information, so to speak. So they have three sections. They have the input gate, the forget gate, and the output gate. So what the input gate does is it looks at all the information coming through and it says, hey, is there something in this new input that is important enough that I want to store it in my cell state? I want to remember this because it might become relevant later. So that's a short-term memory because you're remembering just like one little moment, but it's long-term in the sense of saying like, I'm going to remember this short moment for a very long time. Mm, Not sure. You're just saying it decides how long to remember it? It decides to store it. That's what the input gate talks about. We're going to talk about how long to remember it in a moment. So maybe, have you ever met someone new and then like 30 seconds after you meet them, you can't remember what their name is? Yeah, that's (laughs) really annoying. I have to make like a dedicated point of like remembering, hey, I have to file this person's name. Otherwise, I I lose it. Yeah, I just thought of one. Maybe we should just play the banana game whenever we... (laughs) What's the banana game? (laughs) Like, Linda, Linda, Bobinda, Banana, Nana, Fafana, Linda. What about Mean My Moment? Yeah, I mean, you could continue. I was just going to cut it off because I think people get the idea. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, all right. Well, you can try the banana game. I'm not sure if an LSTM has ever learned to play the banana game. I'm going to go to NIPS this year, so I'll see if any papers come up with a reference to the banana fan of Ophinda algorithm. But you're on the right track. In that case, you're coming up with like a mnemonic to help yourself remember it. In the case of an LSTM, it's just trying to recognize, the input gate wants to recognize when information is important and decide to store it. Lectures are great, but answering questions and solving problems is a much better way to understand things. That's why I want to talk to you guys about Brilliant.org. At Brilliant, they start you off with simple questions that test your understanding and recall. Brilliant offers a really well-curated sequence of guided questions, and there's a ton of courses. Physics of the Everyday is a popular one, but I'd like to really highlight the Artificial Neural Networks course for data skeptic listeners. So guys, I just finished up reviewing a bunch of the quizzes in that section before recording this, because I wanted to make sure I could get on here and not only that I was sending you someplace good, but that I could talk credibly about what they had to offer. If you heard the last ad from Brilliant, you remember I was saying some fun stuff about on like problem of the day, I like to see like I'm competitive with how many people have gotten it right. That works a little differently when I take these actual quizzes. First and foremost, I got to say, almost every question was about 70% correct by most people answering. Now, to me, that's the perfect range. That tells you, first of all, that this works. Most people are learning, but you don't want it you know, above 90% because then the questions are too easy. To me, they're just the right amount of challenge you need, and they'll really get you to understand all the important concepts in deep learning. A great place to start is at brilliant.org. Head over to brilliant.org slash data skeptics. Now that artificial neural networks course, I highly recommend that. Have a pencil and paper with you, or better yet, have a console open if you're a Python person, have NumPy ready. You're not going to have to do too much crazy stuff. The problems are very straightforward, just aimed at teaching you the concepts. So even if you're a little weak at linear algebra, don't worry about it. You're going to be fine. Get up to speed with everything from the perceptron, convolutional neural network, recurrent neural networks, and other architectures. The next step for you is to do some hands-on problem solving. So check out brilliant.org slash data skeptics. In the case of an LSTM, it's just trying to recognize, the input gate wants to recognize when information is important and decide to store it. How it determines what's important is through learning. So we're going to set that aside because that's sort of off topic for what the LSTM is. I just want to talk about more its, its mechanical functionality, if you will. The input gate wants to figure out if something's worth storing or not. Then there's the forget gate, which is the next piece of the neural unit. It looks at the input, just like the input gate does, but it's trying to determine from the input, should I forget the information I have stored? So for example, if you're reading, you know, a book and then a character dies, maybe you can delete their name. Now, actually, they they probably are going to stay relevant in the book for a while, but That's the sort of idea that the forget gate will recognize, hey, something new has happened. Maybe a sentence has changed or uh, the input is different in some way. Whatever I store is no longer relevant. I can learn to forget it. 
and then maybe store something else. So how do you know it's supposed to be forgotten? That is also done through learning. I didn't want to get too deep into this, but let's take the high level of it. As you train the network, there are cases where it can forget under certain circumstances or choose to not forget under certain circumstances. So every new training example, it kind of gets to make a choice in that sense. Should I forget or should I remember? And it needs to be smart about how it decides to do that. It needs to learn how to forget. As contradictory as that sounds. Well, we all learn to forget. Our brains would not be useful if we remembered everything. You are very accurate. How do you know that? I read an article. Where did you get the article? I don't remember. Aha, you learned to forget the sources of your information. Exactly, not relevant. So that's the forget gate. I think you're with me on that. Lastly is the output gate. The output gate has to also look at the input and decide, should I pass along the input as is, or should I mix in what I have in my memory? So maybe an example there could be if you're reading a sentence and you encounter a pronoun. Maybe an LSTM will have stored the name of the person that pronoun refers to, and then it has to learn to decide, should I pass along some, you know, representation that I have in memory of that person's name because I've determined, I've learned that this pronoun refers to them. Sure, that makes sense. So you've got an input gate, a forget gate, and an output gate. Do you understand how they like work together as a family? Uh, I mean, to me, the output gate is just applying that knowledge is what I'm hearing. Yeah, that's one way of looking at it for sure. So LSTMs are this really interesting construction. There's a couple different types. The one I put in the show notes is a sort of a popular one, one of the, like, in my opinion, clearest ways to construct it and draw it on a chalkboard, so to speak. So unlike some of the other neural networks we've discussed where we're talking about individual neurons, an LSTM is sort of a collection, what we call the neural unit. It learns in a couple of ways. It learns at the input gate level, that is what it wants to store. It learns to forget, which is when it wants to clear out the memory. And it learns uh, how to output from its memory or pass along the input. And all those three areas of learning happen through your traditional optimization techniques. And they happen totally undirected from a human being, which is really cool. You don't tell it the circumstances under which to remember and forget. It has to come up with its own strategy and its own representation of what it's storing. So what if it forgot something useful? How does it learn and get that feedback? Ah, Because... If it forgot something useful, then it's going to get a low score when you ask it to make a prediction. And so it gets the low score, and then it says, oh, I was really wrong. How can I adjust myself in the direction of correctness so that Mm. maybe next time I won't make the same mistake? But aren't there other factors that impact its performance, not just whether it forgets? Oh, sure. That's why training still does take a long time on these sorts of things. You're asking the machine to do quite a bit of uh, essentially arithmetic uh, along the way. But basically, all of the information should be there in the input. So if you have a large enough training set, it should be able to figure out different circumstances under which it's good to remember, what to remember, what to forget, and so on and so forth. Mm, Okay. Generally, your neural network is a whole bunch of LSTMs. And then as long as they're not all initialized the same, you initialize them randomly a little bit, they'll all learn different aspects of your training data. So maybe one will learn to recognize you know, something about pronouns, and another will learn to recognize negations. And you'll have all these systems that use the same model of learning to pick out different things about the the training data that it might want to know how to remember and when to share that information. Yeah, I mean, reminds me of the human brain. So, you know, you're just training this program to model it after the human brain. That's right. I don't know if a neurologist would would appreciate the the similarity quite so much because I, I can't say with certainty that we're modeling the actual way the brain does it mechanically, but we're definitely trying to do a process that the brain does that traditionally computers don't do. So in that respect, absolutely, we are modeling the brain. Does this relate to artificial intelligence? I would say absolutely yes, but that's a bit of a matter of debate. I mean, it's just weird to even call it artificial intelligence because... We should just call it regular intelligence. Forget this artificial stuff, right? What if you just call it like logic or something? Is logic too one-dimensional? Because intelligence to me bases it off of humans. Well, what exactly is intelligence we're going to have to pick up at a different time? That's more than one mini episode can handle, but perhaps next year we can get into that. Yeah, because when we see animals, the the headline is always, is this animal intelligent? And it's like, what if intelligence is everywhere, just humans think 
that we have it. As your species, you're talking about our species. Are you not human? Oh yeah, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> Kyle has joined the Yoshi tribe. <laughs> he thinks he's a bird. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you as always for joining me, Lindy. Thank you, Kyle. And until next time, I want to remind everyone to keep thinking skeptically of and with data. Data Skeptic is a listener-supported program. To support the show, visit dataskeptic.com and click on the membership tab. 